seasons of winter And you'd give anything to feel the sun Always reach We're standing always almost at the same place three years ago when we visited Lisbon and uh, we walked through Rato, which is 300 meters away. We dreamt of a community. We were like, we hope it's possible, but we're not sure that it is. Um, and I remember still saying, we were walking down the street, probably about three, 400 meters away from there. We said, imagine a group of people meeting in the heart of the city um, and the gospel starting to thrive in people's lives. And like little did we know that like around us right now, there's like a hundred and something people that we had never met in our lives before. And now suddenly we're standing here celebrating two years of this community. Two years ago, we were with our kids and they said, Mom and Dad, when are we going to find a church? Because it had been quite a while with COVID and everything. Shortly after that conversation, we found ourselves in Airbnb just a couple blocks away from Freedom City. And we showed up and it has been home ever since. Like, we have some of the closest friends we've ever had in our life. Yeah, I'm super happy to find this community because it become really like my family in Lisbon. Every time I enter this door, I feel like, okay, I'm home, I'm safe, and I'm so thankful for this place. Freedom City, for me, it means family. Um, a bunch of people from all these different places in the world coming together and sharing life with each other and showing the world who Jesus is. I think I found my community. Uh, I mean, I, I thought that just being among Brazilians would be like a comfortable place for me, but I think um, like I can see that God is doing amazing things here and it's, it's very alive, like church is alive and relevant. So yeah, like I feel like I'm part of this. City is celebrating two years everyone and in two years the church has already gotten so packed that we need a new building so maybe by the third year we'll have a new building way more people and the church is gonna grow a lot What are we in for today? <laughs> I don't know if you know the name Chris Vinans. He preached here a little while ago. He's the man who planted Glenridge Church in Durban, which in turn planted 3CR 25 plus years ago. And he preached a while back on Revelation chapter 2. Uh, it's, part, it's, the, it's the part of Revelation where uh, Jesus is writing to his bride. And he says in there, you know, he says, you've done this well, you've done this well, you've done this well. The one thing that I want to address is that you've lost your first love. And Chris spoke about how it's not that we need to go back to that you know, warm and fuzzy, googly bear first love of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Because the next verse is, return to those things you did at first. And it came as a word that is a, very much a plumb line, a calling to us as a community, to hold to that very thing that God established this lampstand in the city for. And the primary reason why 3CI exists is to be a base church and to resource and plant churches. And so this morning, we don't have a pulpit, but we, you are going to hear the loudest sermon you've ever heard in your whole entire life, because we want you to cap, be captivated by the culture of 3CR, the very reason why God planted this lampstand in the city, and that is to be a base church that resources and planted, plants churches around the world. And for that, I have the privilege of sitting with the VVIPs this morning, Amen. Jeff and Jane Kirsten, why don't you come up? So we're just going to cross for traffic report quickly. <laughs> uh, man, it is so good to have you here. Who here, by a show of hands, have never met this couple before? Can you read? Look at that. Yo! 
Hello, hello everyone. Well, that's Jeff and that's Jane. Why don't you just quickly introduce yourself? Jeff, introduce Jane the way you've always wanted to introduce her. <laughs> Should be on. There we go. One, two. I love that I haven't met so many of you. This is why we were. Ever, this is the only. That's the reason we were part of this. And um, mm. this is on my journey with Jesus. The most gracious. I know He gave me salvation and the cross and all that stuff, but then He gave me Jane. <laughs> I don't know if it's an upgrade or part of it, or like it's part of the package, but. <laughs> It's an um, upgrade on me, yes, but I'm, I can't give an upgrade on the, on the cross. Um, but um, I want to tell you, I'll say something today, but um, you can listen to this lady because she is the most gracious gift that has ever been given to me, but also, I believe, one of the gracious gifts of God to this church. Um, she was an import, so I married her into the church, but um, I don't think any of you, even those who know her, will never know the powerful woman that she is because of what she can carry. And um, I just want to say to you, like, I want to ask you, not because she's my wife, but because I think she carries the DNA of 3CR, could you open up your hearts <laughs> to what God's done in her and wants to do through her? Beautiful. Yo, she's brownie hot. points for days. <laughs> can we just dim the lights a little bit? <laughs> Janie, do the same, and then also tell us about your children. Okay, am I on? There we go. Yeah, so we have three beautiful children, uh, Taylor, Travis, and Kylie. Uh, Taylor and Trav are sitting in the front. Just raise your hands, guys. I won't get you to stand. Okay, there we go. <laughs> but, and then Kylie um, was adamant she's going down to Super City today, which um, is, yeah, maybe she'll come back. We don't know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, the kids are, they're amazing. They are literally the champions of the story. They have gone through the most insane challenges and difficulties and um, they have overcome so many things and uh, they have come out flying. I mean, we are incredibly, incredibly proud of them and um, it's, uh, you know, whenever you do an international move or any move for that matter, there's challenges, but um, you always, as a mother and as parents, you worry about your children. What are they going to you know, ex what's going to happen to them? How are they going to respond? And um, it wasn't easy at all. I think the biggest challenge has been our children and just what they've faced and what they've gone through. Um, but they have come out flying and uh, they are incredible. <laughs> so take us to the beginning. How did you guys know that you were called to plant a church or wanted to plant a church? <laughs> um, so... Um, the moment of like knowing we're going to plant in Lisbon, it's probably like the end of the journey. Like now it's done. <laughs> like that was the end of the journey. I think it was probably um, we both grew up in, in spaces and homes where um, the gospel got hold of us. Um, I think sometimes in our intellectual world, and especially because we're all exposed to so much media and availability to the gospel in some ways, we can take hold of the gospel. Um, but for us, the gospel got hold of us. It got hold of us at a young age, mm. and then we came into 3CR, and we didn't realize that that was just the taste. And then the gospel got hold of us. The kingdom of God, when Jesus was introduced, like the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom was at hand. Once we all, it was like there was something about the DNA of this church that got hold of us, mm. and part of that was that we existed for others. Um, I remember clearly on that corner of the property where there's an exit, myself, Grant Askham, who leads the bridge, George, who leads highway. The three of us stood at the bottom there with Nick Davis, who was leading the church. And Nick looked up at this property. It was just long grass, a pigsty where the toddler's area is, a little pump house, and a farmhouse that was full of termite hills inside the house. And it was pink. And some strange humans living inside of it. And um, I don't know how. And we stood there, and Nick looked over the land, and he said, Let's build an army to change the world. <laughs> let's, let's, what did he say? He said, let's build an army that will take the gospel to the nations. Yeah. And I think that day, God got hold of me even more. I, I remember it clearly. We were looking yeah. up at the grass. He said, let's build an army that will take, take the gospel to the nations. And so I think there was a, 
there was something that stirred inside of me. I think we got married. We, there was a, people were speaking that into our lives, that we would plant a church. There was an excitement and a fear. But essentially, I think what got us to the point was we learned that you don't plant a church because it needs to happen. You plant a church because God has prepared two humans, and we realized there was a lot of preparation. And so wow. how did we know we were called to plant a church? How did it happen? Well, I got welcomed in, like a lot of you, 23 years ago into this church. The church was smaller than this group of people on the stage at that stage. <laughs> and at that moment, God just infused his mission into my heart. And he yeah. got hold of us, and he shook us, and yeah. that's how we planted a church. So by the time I walked into Rory's office, and it all just happened. We had said yes to loving our friends in this church. We had said yes to an uh, older couple that we didn't, I didn't really know that someone said, well, don't you want to go visit them once a week? I said yes to leading a li many life groups. I said yes to leading the youth when there was no leader. We said yes to starting a, a student ministry. We said yes to, and then we were petrified and said yes to coming on to eldership. And we just said yes to a whole bunch of stuff. And so when God spoke, he had prepared us. He taught us how to say yes, and I think he built something into us. <laughs> yeah. It was just the next natural step. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So who raised it first? <laughs> yeah, so um, it actually it happened at the beginning of uh, 2019 where the, the first mention of Lisbon came about, and that was Dan and Starla, and uh, Starla is Ashley Bell's daughter who planted 3CI. And uh, we were having lunch with them after having been here for a, a meeting. And, um, and out of the blue, I mean, it was the most random thing anyone could ever say. I mean, we're talking about, I don't know, children and something else and cheer whatever, butter cheer butter bread, what we were eating. I don't know. It was like, it was so left wing <laughs> when she said, she just looked at us suddenly. She stopped and she's like, have you ever thought of planting a church in Lisbon? Yeah. And we were just like, where's Lisbon, that? where is that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she actually didn't know that, um, so I'm half Portuguese, uh, but my family comes from the island of Madeira, and um, so I'd never been to mainland Portugal before, I'd never been to Lisbon, but I'd been to Madeira very often uh, to see my family, and uh, Star didn't know that, and, uh, and that actually is more the reason I was like, Hell no, I'm not going <laughs> anywhere near there. Um, not because I didn't, you know, it was just, it was so different. The culture is so different. I wasn't raised Portuguese. I don't speak the language. It was just, it, but I had the passport and so did our kids. And, uh, and so we left that thought completely. Like we, were, we left that conversation. We were like, there's no way, absolutely not. We're not going to, we're not even going to consider we it. We laughed about it. We just bought our home. Like we were here. We were yeah. on team. We'd. Yeah, we were going into a building project almost, yeah. yeah. And, um, and then it just didn't stop. Two months later, there's too many things to tell right now of how God spoke to us and how he moved our hearts. And, uh, and at the same time, it wasn't just us that he was speaking to. And I think that was what was so beautiful is it was a collective of people. It was, it, it's where that scripture says it's, it was um, good between us and the Holy Spirit. And it was raw and mild felt something. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were so many others that came with us that had their own stories that, of remarkable, remarkable things of how God opened up Portugal um, for them to come. So. So the first whisper in 2019, you're in Portugal in 2020. Yeah. Wonder where you're going to be next year. <laughs> hey? yeah, yeah. It's the perp this is why we've stopped everything for this, because we are trusting that God awakened something of this call of 3CR in our midst. Beautiful. Hey? Bloemfontein is calling. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you started just as lockdown started, hey? Yeah. What was the first year like, <laughs> locked up in a foreign country? Well, you know, firstly, I mean, South Africans, come on. We are brave people. <laughs> we have been through a lot. And so when we heard the rumblings of COVID, we're like, nah, yeah. nah. You've seen nothing, Europe. We've seen it all. <laughs> so we were very like, yeah, we were brave. <laughs> it's not going to hit. We were you know, brave like, for it. For a short while. <laughs> we were very confident for a short while, and then it hit. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it was amazing because, to be honest, I don't know how we did it. 
Um, that guy you mentioned, Chris Vinan, said he knew of at least 40 or 50 church plants at the same period as us, and not one of them decided to carry through. They all just went wow. back to where they came from. Wow. So I was like, that's scarier. Like, <laughs> that's scarier to look. And I was probably just pride inside of me, need to prove something. I don't know. But it's that South African thing inside <laughs> of us. And, um, and i got to say, I think COVID is a good example because everywhere we go in the world, you find South Africans leading churches. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I don't want us to be the last generation of South mm. Africans that learns to say yes when the rest of the world says no. Yeah. And, sure. um, and there was something to that. COVID came and it was like COVID was in our face and it was almost like a taunting. Are you the last, was that the last generation of South Africans to be bold, to be brave, to be full yeah. of faith, to be people that believe the Father? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> eventually and, it became that. It became, eventually it was like, maybe. <laughs> Yes, we're the weak generation. <laughs> no, but um, did you ever did you ever think of packing it in uh, over the last few years? Even was it hard? <laughs> was it the worst season of our life? Absolutely. Yeah. Was it? Did we almost die? Absolutely. Was it? Um, <laughs> but here's the thing: we didn't feel like Jeff and Jane were trying to do anything in Portugal. Yeah. We didn't go there thinking like, yes, we're going to do something for the kingdom. I meet lots of young people who want to do something amazing for the kingdom, and then I yawn and wait for them to get over it. <laughs> and then um, until they actually realize they're part of something greater. And I think we realized that we were part of God's church plant in Lisbon, that he had a heart for those people, that Isaiah 42, 43, that section of scripture was very, very much part of this church plant. And he says there, you worship me, and I will bring my sons and daughters from the yeah. north, the east, the south, and the west. Yeah. And so I stood in a meeting with, yeah. well, on a day with hundreds of people, and I just said, there was a day in history where I walked the streets of Lisbon, and God said, I want you to plant a church here. I said, but that same day, he was busy working in your lives and orchestrating that you would be here. So I don't know which of those calls, which of those moments, which of those whispers was more important. I actually think yours was, because I could be here, like, speaking to an empty room, but actually God's busy building an army of people that could go to the nations, like, like um, what's his name? Nick Davis said. And so I, I think being in the middle of COVID, we realized we're not trying to accomplish anything. God's busy doing something. He's going to do it. He's got a role for us to play for a season in the life of this church in Lisbon. And it's like, it is almost like an invitation. It wasn't a taunt. It was just like, will it be you or will it be someone else? And I think like when you realize, when we realize we could be some part of something so huge <laughs> and global in what he's doing, mm. this is part of the history of the church. It's like we could do no other. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's that it ties into... Like, this wasn't a decision from Jeff and Jane. This is a life. This is a, we learned it here. We watched people, and then we realized, like, we can do no other. He got hold of us. The gospel got hold of us. So we were just, like, on this journey with Jesus and a bunch of crazy people. Yeah. So tell us, tell us about Freedom City. How is she doing? We hear such good reports. We have people coming back with bunches and bunches of grapes. Tell us some stories. Okay. you we can get tissue. <laughs> no. no, it's honestly what God is doing is absolutely mind blowing. And um, it's not an isolation. That's the first thing. Like um, it's, it's happening all over the world in very, very different ways. Um, and sometimes you, you kind of reject it because you think it's not in the packaging that you used to or the way that we've been taught or the way we, we see things in scripture. And um, And so we have met the most incredible people, the most remarkable people, but also the most lost and the most broken and the most far from God people I've ever met in my life. (laughs) I mean, we're talking witchcraft, tarot cards, spells, crystals, psychedelic drugs, orgies, you name it. We've seen it all, we've heard it all. (laughs) It's just, we haven't watched those. (laughs) <laughs> but, well, not, I mean, we saw one happening above, yeah, in, a, in an apartment building and just close the windows. But, um, no, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's so different that it's hard to describe. Um, but the people are beautiful. The people are incredible. And, 
Yet they don't, they don't know God. The majority do not know God at all. You do not meet a Christian on the street. You do not hear uh, a prayer prayed in a restaurant. Um, it, it isn't like here you, there are so many churches all over the place um, that are full on Sundays. Um, there are churches all over the place, but they're empty and they're ancient. And, um, but yet... Something is happening, and there is rumbles all over the place, the Catholic Church included. Mm. It's like unbelievable what we're seeing. So, um, we've, yeah, we've, there's so many stories. I don't even know if we. You wanted to. Okay, so. Um, I have a, a dear friend, uh, well, she's a dear friend now, and we met her um, through Jeff, one of the. the so we, Portugal kind of did lockdowns uh, differently. Um, things were never fully closed for long periods of time. So they would close for a certain period of time, then they would open up, and then we just had a whole bunch of regulations we had to adhere to, and then we would, you know, lock down again for when it got tough again. And so there was always this period of, like, open, close, open, close. And so in one of the open moments, coffee shops were open, and um, Jeff would go and, and just sit in a coffee shop and work. And, and one day... Um, a guy from the UK was sitting across him and he, he just happened to say to Jeff, hey, I, I like your kicks, which Jeff, uh, Rory had given to, to, to Jeff, <laughs> um, his shoes. And, um, and, and just like, oh, cool, you know, and then they kind of got chatting and whatever. And then um, he, he asked you what you did. <laughs> I was tired of making up stories. And Jeff was very tired of, of telling you know, stories about like kind of the long way around so that we didn't get sworn at or, you know, told that we were there to steal people's money and hurt their children and all those crazy things. Um, and so um, so he, met, he, he started a conversation. He just blurted out like, you know, maybe you should tell that part of the story. <laughs> Cause I, um, I said, I was trying to explain stuff and I was like, we're planning a Christian church. But it's like we're having a conversation across the coffee shop, so there's people in between us. And then he swore at me across the people. And then I carried on, he carried on, and then eventually he came and sat next to me. He's like, tell me more. And we sure. started chatting, and he's like, I hate, I, I, got, I want nothing to do with Christianity and stuff. I just find it interesting that you can be that dumb, so I want to find out why. <laughs> so anyway, everyone's listening to our conversation. Long story short, we became really, really good friends. Um, he was a big in the music industry, and um, we inv I eventually invited him over for dinner and said, bring your girlfriend with. Mm. So, so we meet her, and um, she is honestly, I mean, immediately we connect, but um, not on like a, any other level than other than just kind of we just connected on, on friendship level. And um, anyway, it's, it's a long story, but basically um, by the end of the evening, she was crying and Jeff had been explaining how, like, just marriage, because marriage is such a foreign thing to a lot of people, um, and the, especially the kind of way we do it. And um, he, and they'd been asking us because they were dating, and and yeah, they just got asking them questions around how does he see me and, and all that. And the next minute, she's just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Anyway, long story short, basically he moves across the table from her, <laughs> distances himself. He couldn't handle the, the pressure, and she went back and um, then just said to him, listen, what is this relationship? Like, what is this? Like, we're living together. Like, I, I can't do this if it doesn't mean it's going to end in that. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, anyway, th they broke up, and uh, she gave her life to Jesus about six months later mm. um, at, on Christmas Day. And um, she has been radically, radically transformed. I mean, absolutely. She's one of our worship leaders now. She's leading our dinner, one of our dinner parties. Um, she is just, she's become such a dear friend that she doesn't look the part of a Christian girl. <laughs> and so she has experienced incredible rejection and um, even within uh, Christian circles and people that she's now met and, and and she often refers to herself as the woman at the wall and, um, and how God redeemed her. And he has. He has redeemed her and we will fight for her. We love her. We will, no matter what she looks like, no matter what she says, like we love her so much. And she has been so transformed over the three years that we've known her to the point now where, I mean, she's leading others to God. She is just, it's absolutely amazing what's happened with her life. I hear rumors that your worship leader got saved. Yeah. At Freedom City, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So Matej also, Matej got sent the song Waymaker um, by someone else in our community, and um, and he was running down the promenade listening to it because he loves music down the, by the river. 
And the next minute, he just felt this overwhelming presence of God. Right. And um, he ran literally straight to Jeff, um, who was at the, the venue um, where we meet. And um, he just ran in and he just slammed the table down like this. Is, I believe, I believe, I believe. And he was a complete atheist, hated the church, hated Christians, hated any form of institution. And he was radically transformed. Mm-hmm. Loves music, loves people, loves food, everything that we honor about. And he just... Him, his whole family, they've got a little little boy now. And, uh, oh, it's just incredible to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I add one story to that? <laughs> just the, um, well, I could tell you so many stories. And I could tell you about a Danish man that was on a 25-year journey looking for God. He sold his business, distinguished Danish man, on a journey around the world, living with shaman, living in caves, living in temples, living in every part of the world looking for God. His last stop before his kids had his children had kids was Lisbon. His last stop, he sat on a couch like this, and he just said, "I still haven't found God." And he heard an audible voice say, um, "How long?" I won't mention his name, but I just I was, the stories are sacred. But it's like, how long will you keep running from me? Audible. And he said, Who are you? And he said, "My name is Jesus." Sure. So he's googled Jesus came up with obviously all sorts of weird things on the, bar, uh, on the internet. And so he thought, um, I don't know how to, so he said, Jesus in Lisbon. And we had just finished doing a YouTube series called Jesus in Lisbon. Yeah. And he watched every single episode. Wow. So one day I got to church and this very distinguished man walks up to me and he says, good day, Jeff, this is my name. I'm part of your church. I know everything about I said, do I know you? He said, no, but I know everything about you, all your stories. <laughs> TV evangelist. I was freaked out. <laughs> and um, he went downstairs, and we were starting a series in the book of Jonah. And I said, before we start this series, I want to ask you one question. So I didn't know any of this yet. I said, how long will you keep running from God? He just, I just hear, ah! <laughs> this distinguished man just broke. And it's like, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories most of them with people that have never been into the church. I can tell you about the cafe and how people have come in and the, none of them are Christians. And sitting on the couch, a girl asking this girl, saying, I know you won't know this, but do you know anyone who might know, who might know where to find Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> An Australian girl asks this and she says, I found him. I can, I can show you. Anyway, and then she says, no, no, I, I found, I bought this book that, that they call the Bible. She's like, really, you got one? She pulls it out of her bag. It's this big purple thing. She was like, where did you get that? She says, oh, I had to order it in Germany because you can't get Bibles in Portugal in English. And so she says, that's my Bible. And she pulls it out. She, the exact same Bible, same color from the same supplier in Germany. They had ordered it in the same week. They didn't even know each other. It's like, I can tell you story after story after story after story about, it's like just seeing these baptisms. We've had that many people in the last two months fly from other countries, buy international fl- tickets to fly to Lisbon to be baptized in this church because they met Jesus on holiday in Lisbon or they met him in their period that they were living in Lisbon because it's super transient. Like half our church won't be living in our city probably in the next four months to six months. Mm. So it's like, it's a very different dynamic. It's hard because of that. Um, but the reality is people are meeting Jesus for the first time. And because they're meeting him, they then go back. And we had, a, we had a girl fly from Barcelona. She was moving to India. She said, I have to be baptized before. It's a crazy story I won't get into of how she knew she had to get baptized. And she flew. She had one day left. She flew from Barcelona to Lisbon. Duncan baptized her, a whole bunch of our guys. A girl flew last two weeks ago. She flew from Norway to be baptized because I met her in the coffee shop and it's like no, it's, we had people fly from Germany, a couple who also went on this New Age journey and were in Bali and they found a Bible and they started reading it. They read the whole thing on holiday. <laughs> they came to Lisbon on the way back to Germany. Their first time they ever walked into a church on Easter last year. Easter last year. That, that meeting that you watched there was, was the meeting that they were at. And they um, just wept and wept and wept. I walked to them afterwards. I said, what's going on? And they said, we read about it, but now we've seen it. <laughs> sure. They've never seen anything like this. Amazing. So I can tell you about people that fl- are flying, international tickets, and then they flew back from Germany to be baptized. It's just people are flying in to be baptized. I'm like, and a, yeah, there's a pool right there, <laughs> yeah. and no one in Pretoria has to go anywhere. 
to find Jesus because of 3CI. <laughs> sure. And I was like, this is radical. You don't realize what we've got because the whole of Europe doesn't have this. Yeah. And so, so, yeah. so if you were to look at your church, um, guesstimate how many of them were saved into the church versus how many of them came already as born-again believers. Where would you land that slider? It's so hard wise? because of the transient nature, but I'd say more than half um, more than half getting saved, saved in the church. The church yeah. mm. Some of them are still being saved. In. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ashley Bell, who planted this church, uh, had a phrase I'll never forget. He said, people are waiting on the other side of your obedience. And um, on behalf of 3CI and the elders and all your friends, I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being obedient. Because people are waiting on the other side of your obedience as people are waiting on the other side of ours. In closing, how can, we, how can we get behind you guys as a couple? How can we get behind your family? Um, and how can we get behind the church? Is there something you're going like, yo, if you can send us 100 people a month to do that, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> So, I mean, we always need prayer. <laughs> yeah. um, so please remember us in your prayers. Um, but actually a story comes to mind. Um, a few years ago, it's, uh, Jeff and a couple of the elders got to go into the sunny side to see the underworld. And uh, they spoke to a police officer there who wasn't a Christian. And, I mean, everything inside of the guy's hearts were like, how can we help? How can we, how can we get behind what you're doing? How can we mm. make trafficking go away or the drug scene go away or whatever and all she said she said if you can just carry on loving Jesus loving people and keeping people from becoming the problem that are causing the problems the human problem the the the, the human decay um, if you can if you can teach people the truth the the ways of God this is an unbeliever speaking she said because that changes that changes the 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 demand it changes everything. And I think what I would love to say is that actually what we need is people to, to continue to be radical for Jesus because it doesn't matter where you are, God, will, God, God is busy. And I know that's not a direct thing to us. I'm, I'm talking very broadly here, but I think it does have a ripple effect because every one of you knows someone in Europe. Every one of you knows someone here even that. God is working in their lives. And I think if we can just remain in a place of freedom, if we can remain in a place where we know that we are accepted and we are redeemed and that we can be secure in who we are and authentic and real in who we are and then just love people, it will have an exponential ripple effect. And I think that's our greatest cry is actually that people will really love one another in our church. And because it's, it's one thing to say it, like, I love you. But when you're confronted with someone who doesn't look like you want them to look and you think you need to fix them or, you, or they speak in a certain way and it's not fitting your paradigm or there's a, a conflict or there's an offense and you need to forgive. And it's very easy to say, I love people, but when it comes to the nitty gritty, it's not easy. And so that's what we're trusting for is that people get a radical, radical revelation of the love of God. Jeff. <laughs> If, um, yeah, if, if you had to leave us with a charge, what would that be? Yeah. I'm thinking of the 400 people who just joined today, yeah. two and a half thousand that are part of the furniture. You say something to the 400. Yeah, I think. I see a hospital pass here to Jane. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> you I'm ready. I think, again, it's that, it's that thing of... Um, Becoming secure, becoming a son and daughter of God, firstly, and then the house, this home, this place. When you become family, there, there should be a freedom to make mistakes. There should be a freedom to be yourself. There should be, but then there's also that, that time where the children grow up and they start to take responsibility and they, they start to, to, to move into the things of God and to partner with him in what he's doing. And, and I think as, as people coming into this church, don't let it just be a dutiful Sunday, Sunday attendance. Let it be something that, and the church is way more than just these 
walls and this building. The church is everywhere. It's everywhere you are, the church is. And, and so carry the gospel, carry the message of, of the kingdom with you and, 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 and really let God change you. Let God just move through everything in your life and, 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 and redeem you. Yeah, I'd say um, this place... This place is amazing. Look at this building. <laughs> it's like, this place is amazing. This church is incredible. Like, I trust the leaders of this church with my life, with my children's lives. I trust Freedom City with this church. We don't feel like Jeff and Jane Brenton planted a church. 3CR planted a church. Mm. We just see it as an extension of this mm. there. We feel like it's one church in some ways. Um, and I say that because as amazing as this is, if you're a consumer in this place... <laughs> You're going to get bored quickly. <laughs> Even in such an amazing place, you're going to get bored. You're going to get up to nonsense because you're going to get bored. But if you're a contributor, it is so much more exciting to be part of the contribution yeah. of God's forward momentum mm. in something as exciting as this. And then you start to be part of it. You get pulled into it. Mm. And like the thing that I started with, where the gospel takes hold of you, that's uncontrollable. Then you find yourself in places with people that you never dreamed possible. You find yourself doing things that you like in Scripture said, that you go before kings and you find yourself saying things that you never thought possible, doing things you never dreamt of. They're beyond your dreams. And so... I want to say to you, like, don't be a consumer in this place. Mm. Be a contributor in any little way, like I said, of our own lives towards the step of obedience of saying yes to God. Like any little place, inconvenient, silly, just do it. Just say yes. Um, I want to also just say to those of you that have been here for a long time, um, the whole journey of God with his people. We don't have to look far through the book of Exodus the whole journey of God with his people is that he takes them and he says, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to run away from Egypt and then I'm going to like, the Red Sea is going to open like this and this is what's going to happen. And then they think, okay, cool, we know how God works. And so Nick Davis leads this church. One or two other people lead the church. We see the goodness of God. I walked into that and I'm like, okay, I know how God works. The problem is the next time God works, he doesn't do the same thing. <laughs> And things start to change. And so we have to walk with God. We don't have to walk. We can't create a picture of what God's doing and then serve that picture. He's not serving that picture. The Holy Spirit is moving forward and he's taking a people on a journey. And so if you've been here for a while, you think you know how God's working in this church. You think you know the DNA of this church, how God, no, 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 he's never going to work the same again. And so when God decides to take another step, now it's going to be the Jordan, then it's going to be this, then we're going to go over a mountain. And you're like, why a mountain? What's up with these leaders? Why are they taking us over a mountain? Last time we just walked through a Red Sea. It's like, could you walk with Jesus? Yeah. Could you open your eyes? The criticism of the people was that you have eyes, but you do not see. You have ears, but you do not hear. The people of God always felt trapped to say, we want a king, not a priest. And it's like, no, God's given you priests. People that would hear the voice of God lead you in a direction. And I want to say to you that have been here for a while, could you also hear the whispers of God. Could you realize that when God moves differently to how he has in the past, this is the most exciting season that this yeah. church has ever walked into. And it's like you're about to enter into something. You're one more step closer to the promised land. Kevin and Caroline are serving today. I saw that lanyard over their, over their necks. I saw them carrying stuff. And I just thought, well done for saying yes again and again and again. And Tim Keller says this, you you have to cross the betrayal barrier of moving from the past successes into the future victories that God has for you, these battles that he has for you. And if God, if Nick Davis was right on that corner saying, let's train up an army of people that'll take the good news of the gospel to the nations, you're going to cross many betrayal barriers. And so I have to say yes to God often, and you have to sit next to someone, you're going to have to inconvenience yourself. The real hero, as Jane said it, I can tell you all the stories, but those two kids over there... Kylie is amazing, but she'll do anything fun. <laughs> Those guys, they didn't choose it, mm. but they're choosing it. <laughs> and they're saying yes. Mm. And um, we did everything wrong that parents shouldn't do <laughs> by doing this. And they have had no sleep for four and a half years. <laughs> and they have been inconvenienced. And but they are strong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they can carry anything. <laughs> And I'm telling you, when I look around, even in our church, the children look weak compared to them. And I want to say to you, parents, do not, 
do not forfeit your kids' inheritance because of the inconvenience it causes for you. You know how inconvenient it is for us to like, for have crying kids because they're tired. You know how inconvenient it's been to make our kids do things and feel like a, a bad parent because parenting styles have changed and we still want to stick to biblical truths and to follow Jesus when he says, follow me, and to keep doing that. But I'll keep doing it because it's made them stronger. And like parents, I want to say, like, don't steal their inheritance because it's easier for you to stick to rhythms and do this and make sure we never inconvenience and stretched because they're the ones that will suffer. And look around the church world today. Young people want to be part of something great, but they don't want to carry the responsibility. And I'm like, let us not be the cause of another generation that will not carry responsibility because we protected them too much. Sorry, yeah. that was like, am I allowed That's to very good, like very that? good. <laughs> I know you've asked for prayer, but in closing, can we ask for prayer? Um, you know, you see in scripture the laying on of hands where there's impartation of a gift. Um, and I, can I ask you would, you, would you pray for us? Would you stretch out your hands? Something of this fire that you've found that's been forged in the nations would come upon us, upon this church, upon her call, upon her role and responsibility in the city and in the nations. And then Raw's going to close. <laughs> Lord, we want to say, like David, we want to say with fear and trembling, yeah, we are, Lord, send us. Send us into 3CI. Send us amongst the people. Send us into the rattling hearts. Send us into the lonely. Send us to the children of this church. Lord, send us in prayer. Send us into the city of Pretoria. Send us into this nation that desperately needs hope. And then, Lord, send us into the nations that are barren and bare. Lord, 45 church plants in Lisbon in the last four years and 44 are closed. Lord, because cities are waiting, desperately waiting for the hope of Jesus to come. They're not waiting for institutions. They're waiting for love, for people to be loved. And I pray in this church, as I know the leaders of this church have pointed everyone in this building towards the Father in heaven that loves dearly. I pray that that love would permeate in our hearts. I pray, Father, that not only would we get a grasp of who you are, not only would we start to understand how you work, but I pray the gospel would take hold of us, Lord. The kingdom of God that is forcefully advancing would take hold of our hearts, Lord, that we could do no other. That we would find ourselves taking steps of faith in our, in our jobs, taking steps of faith in our families, taking steps of faith in our relationships, Lord, because we can do no other. I pray that you would take hold of us. A ruggedness would beset this church, Lord. A, an abandonment of our own possessions, an abandonment of our own ideas and plans would take hold of us, Lord, where there's something greater that takes hold of us, something that demands more but gives us the delight of our souls. I pray that you would come over this church, that you would love these people in a way that changes their decision-making. I pray that this church would always be a place, like it is right now, that sows into the nations, that the nations of this world will be blessed before you come back with love, with generosity, with faith, with, pe with people of peace. And I pray, God, that you would raise up men and women in this place with fire in their eyes and a burning belly saying, I can do no other. In Jesus' name. I'm not sure if Andre and Zeli Elsa are here. Are you here this morning? They come morning and sometimes evening. Are they here? Andre and Zeli. Where are you? Zeli, what are you? Andre said, can you say, can you Zeli say, where was Zeli? Say, is there. Come here, go, go, Zeli. I just want you to, to
to look at, um, you can come sit here, Zeli, but next to Mel. Just put your hand, your, the camera on Jeff's right arm and Jane's left arm. Just put that there. Come sit here, Zeli. You think we all just sit here and think it's like a really radical couple <laughs> counting for God and they're like, they dress trendy and they're all tattooed up and it's, it's really cool. <laughs> but Zeli's going to tell you what those tattoos mean. Oh, let me just stand here with you. Okay, so seven years ago, this beautiful couple had the privilege of receiving a baby with Down syndrome, not knowing what it meant, um, scared of what the future holds, and God chose them to be the parents, and he chose those two kids to be the siblings of an incredible, incredible gift. And this tattoo, it's three arrows showing up and it, it means um, the lucky few. It's a symbol of the lucky few and it resembles parents worldwide who are lucky to have a child in their homes with Down syndrome. So, um, And it's just incredible how the world looks at kids and people with Down syndrome. Um, and God wants to change that. And, and he considers us lucky to have a child with special needs. And, and I just want to honor you, the way that you, you carry this mark. And if people ask you about it, then you have the privilege to share um, yes, and may your, may your daughter, I know the day that she was born, we celebrated yeah. her birth, yeah. um, where when my son was born with Down syndrome, we received sympathy cards the day of his birth, um, flowers and cards which said, we, we sympathize with the birth of your son. And when I hear a baby with Down syndrome born into a family, I say, yes, <laughs> yes, how lucky you are. So, so, yeah, this is just incredible. We love you. So what's stopping you going? Because their whole support system is in South Africa. And Jane comes from a family where her sister had Down syndrome and her parents never stopped at serving Jesus. And so she knew when she had a Down syndrome child, it could completely affect the whole way they do life. I just looked at those tattoos and I thought, those are marks of unbelievable faith. You are heroes of this church, Jeff and Jane. And they go, well, why did you come today? Because we honor people. We glorify God, but we honor people. I love you. Like, really, really love you. I pray for you every day. And I'm so proud of you. And it's incredible just to stop everything sometimes and just say, hey, hey, this is what it's about. It's about our family and our friends. I want to put a, a, a picture up on the, it's called Lisbon is On. This is in Harry Smith. My business is in Harry Smith. And for those who don't know, when Jeff and Jane came and spoke to me, the following day I went to Harry Smith on business and I was driving through town and you can see the L of the window at the bottom is broken and the B is broken. And it just says, Lisbon is on. You say, how did God speak to me like that? In a Portuguese fruit and veggie shop in Harry Smith. I don't know, just keep it up there. I don't know what the top part of, it, of your story is, but I want to tell you the bottom part. It's on. It's on.
Your healing is on. Your redemption is on. Your baptism is on. Can you imagine how God used stones or something to break the L and the B? To just speak to a dumb pastor from Pretoria in Harry Smith about the beautiful DNA that he's given to you. I want to say we're so proud of you. But today is like you're standing on the stage with a yes in your heart to every person here. And you might say to yourself, God, how can I ever get healed? Healing is on. Healing is on. Restoration is on. Those little tattoos. God knows your children better than you do. He knows them better than you do. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jeff and Jane, for Tate, for Kylie, for Trav, Lord God. Thank you for this family. Thank you for every person in this church that has made it possible for us to plant churches. Thank you for your generosity to us over many, many years. Thank you for three stripes on an arm. And thank you for a Portuguese passport. What passport have you got? Why are you here this morning? I just want to say these two words over your life. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on.